Okay. All right. So now let me uh, pause and say, uh, are there, I wonder if we should do Q&A right now just after I've done that before I talk about nonlinear things. Because the nonlinear things are less connected to what most people do in Pilot. I just show it in case, you know, some people wanted to see. But uh, let, why don't we, you know, do some Q&A. Um, do people have questions about what I went over or want, or want me to do something, want me to show a particular kind of solver or something like that? Okay. Um, then should I just go on and show you some about the nonlinear systems then? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. I will. So these are the this is the last part of the slides. Um, so. What I want to show is an example. Um, I don't have a, a pilot example of this uh, because we we don't make uh, a lot of use of the nonlinear solver yet. Um, I anticipate we will when the when the multi physics comes online. The the coupling between two different physics is very often nonlinear and can have localization happening and Therefore, the, the nonlinear problems are hard to solve. Right now, we use nonlinearity mostly for some nonlinear rheologies, which are fairly simple to solve. Newton works fairly well. We also use it to solve um, the friction, which is harder, but we have pretty good guesses. And usually, it works really well, all except for the first iterate. So. Um, I want to show you some harder nonlinear problems because I think that this is the future for Pilot. So this problem is one that you can find in Petsy. You have it because you have a Petsy installation. It's um, this magenta up here. Hold on, I will get my pointer. So this magenta up here, it's a link directly to the problem online. So you can, you can look at the code if you want while I'm talking about this. It is the driven cavity problem. So it's a problem very much like what we would like to get to. The first multi-physics problems we want to put in Pilot uh, are uh, incompressible elasticity and um, elasticity coupled with uh, thermodynamics. And so this is a coupling of Stokes with thermodynamics. So it would be very, very similar to what we can expect in, uh, in Pilot. Uh, so um, here we have a, a box, and the, we are shaking the top of the box, which is lid velocity, um, and we are heating the box from below. So you have a Grashof number, and you also have a Prandtl number, but I'll just let the Prandtl number be 1. And if I let the Prandtl number be 1, then the Grashof number is the Rayleigh number, right? So um, we can see uh, the nonlinear solver is converging very nicely. Uh, you know, it, it's a little bit, it's, it's linear convergence out here at the beginning, and then you can see quadratic convergence sets in later. OK, people will you'll accept that. Uh, and if we ramp off up the Grashof number, which, as I said, is the Rayleigh number here in this problem, then it's still doing OK at Rayleigh number 10,000. At Rayleigh number 100,000, however, things start to go wrong. Um, so what went wrong? Well, Petsy is telling us, we have uh, SNES converged reason, is telling us that the linear solve quit working. All right, well, what happened there? 
um, what we can do is we can say, well, let's make sure that the linear solve works right. So you just use LU. Okay, now the linear solve is working, and we see that, well, the problem really wasn't in the linear solve itself. It was in the nonlinear solve, because even with exact linear solves, we just stop converging down here in Newton. Okay, so what's wrong? Well, you can check things, you can use things like SNES check Jacobian. Maybe the Jacobian's wrong. Uh, maybe it's only wrong in parallel. Maybe it's only wrong if some kind of physics is turned on. So you can always check with this and it'll compare your, um, it'll compare your Jacobian to a finite difference approximation of the Jacobian that we make. And if the difference isn't small, then something's probably wrong. An inconsistency between your residual and your Jacobian. Maybe the, the linear system isn't being solved well enough, but we know ours is, so that's not our problem. Um, you can also check that your linear system um, solves are accurate by using this KSP monitor true residual. It's possible for your preconditioner to be very out of whack or almost singular, distorting um, the residual that you see coming out of the, the linear solver, but you can always use this to, uh, to look at the true residual. Um, maybe uh, the Jacobian is singular and has an inconsistent right-hand side. That's not happening in this problem. Or maybe the nonlinear is just tough. And that is what is happening in this problem. You can try different line searches. You can try a trust region technique. You can try grid sequencing. None of those work in this problem. I have tried them all. I just won't go through all of them. So what we propose and, and we also have incorporated into PETSI, is trying what we call nonlinear preconditioning. So remember that we, we said that the linear preconditioning really looks just like composing a bunch of linear solvers together to treat different parts of the problem or different reasons it's hard. You can do the same thing with nonlinear solvers, where you compose a bunch of nonlinear solvers together. So here we have GM res, here we have nonlinear GM res, here we have a Richardson extrapolation, here we have nonlinear Richardson extrapolation, or basically steepest descent method. So uh, there are a bunch of reasons to do this. Very often people do things like take a couple steps of Picard and then run Newton. And here's a replacement for that where you don't have to change your code at all, where you uh, couple uh, Newton to um, uh, five steps of sequence descent each iteration, which cleans up a lot of uh, the stuff. You can also do things like use nonlinear GM res to uh, clean up a noisy Jacobian. Say you have stochastic terms in your Jacobian or something like that. Then what this does is takes five directions that are predicted by Newton um, and then forms a little subspace and picks the best direction out of the space formed by those five. So if you have a little noisiness, this will get rid of it. Um, there's also things that can handle localized nonlinearities. So if you have one little bit of your domain that's really tough, something like Aspen will be useful because what it does is solves a nonlinear problem in, in each subdomain and then combines them together. So let's take a look at this again. Uh, I'm going to go right to the boundary of good and bad. Instead of um, 1 e to the 5, I'll sit at 5 e to the 4, so uh, Rayleigh number of 50,000, and see we're still not converging, whereas we converge with Rayleigh number of 10,000. Um, let's try, instead of um, Newton, let's try the nonlinear multigrid. So what we'll do is we'll run nonlinear multigrid, which is known as the full approximation scheme, or FAS. And on each level of multigrid, instead of running Newton, we'll run a simple gauss seidel sweep. So solve the first equation, then solve the second equation, then solve the third equation with, with 1D Newton. And we'll use six levels. Well, this is still not converging, and it says it's not converging because one of the inner iterations didn't converge. So let's check. You can always turn on monitors or converge reasons. So 
what's happening here is that the core solver Newton failed to converge. Okay, I can believe that. But I don't really care about the core solver. I care about the full problem. So we say, okay, look, shut off the line search on the course solver. So just let it plow through. And it does. So um, eventually, you know, the, the course solver is converging pretty well. Um, but the outer solver is still not converging. So this multigrid is not working. So what if in, uh, we add, as I said with with the warm start Newton, what if we add a little steepest descent on the outside of our process? So now we're composing steepest descent, one iterate, <coughs> with um, our nonlinear multigrid. So now the nonlinear multigrid becomes a nonlinear preconditioner, so NPC just like PC, and we actually end up converging. You can, you can converge the system even with a very high Rayleigh number. Uh, it turns out that if we use something smarter than NGM res, here we're going to, I mean, smarter than, than steepest descent is, is nonlinear GM res, um, where we take a few directions and pick the best ones, so we solve a little, a little optimization problem. Um, we can converge in half the number of iterates. We, we cut 45 down to, well, not half, but 29, so, you know, much less. Now, what if instead of, um, instead of gauss seidel we actually use Newton, but we allow we have no line search and we let there be failures. So Newton is not going to, we know Newton doesn't work for a while, but it turns out that if you just make some progress with Newton before it stalls and then let the nonlinear multigrid process work, you can converge, whoops, you can converge instead of in 29 iterates, in 5 iterates. So putting these solvers together in different ways um, can really benefit you if you, if, you, if you take the time to play around with it. And in fact, there's other ways to put them together. So here, we're going to say, well, instead of using Newton as a subsolver of FAS, what if you just ran the regular FAS, the regular Newton, but you kind of took the best answer between the two of them each time, which is this additive optimal, what would happen? Well, you can, you can converge in seven iterates. And if you do it multiplicatively, so one, then the other, one, then the other, one, then the other, you can converge in five. So it turns out that putting the different solvers together in different combinations can be very, very effective. And here is mathematical notation for all these, and the times and the you know, number of iterates and function evaluations to compare. You can see the vastly different on the number of function evaluations that you do, number of Jacobian evaluations that you do, and preconditioner applications, and linear and nonlinear iterates. Each of these ones, each of these things has different performance characteristics. They scale differently in parallel. They respond differently to, to um, problem regimes. So it's very, very difficult to say who is the winner. And so the ability to experiment with all these is paramount because we're, we just no way to predict which one will be good for which problem. We have a uh, uh, paper on this, which you can get at this Magenta link. It's going to come out in Siam Review, I think, the next issue. And for any other solver problems, really do mail uh, CIG short uh, where we can, we are, we are always online and we can help you out with this stuff. Okay, uh, that's, that's basically what I wanted to say about nonlinear solvers, I think. Um, you know, what the, what the opportunities are. Uh, the, first and foremost, if, you're, if your nonlinear iteration is not, not converging, then something's wrong with your linear solver. So remember when I made the mistake when I was running um, step 10, uh, we, the nonlinear solver was taking many iterates to converge on a problem that I knew to be linear. That happened because uh, the linear solver was, was uh, giving me wrong results. GM res was, 
was reporting small residuals when the residuals were not small. And so usually what you want to do is go back and uh, examine your linear solver if the nonlinear uh, solver is misbehaving in Pyleth right now. We, um, but later on, we'll get nonlinear problems that are so hard that the linear solver is great and the nonlinear is still not converging. Okay, so I guess we can move into 